أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا بالقاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ أخذنا ميثاق بني إسرائيل لا تعبدون إلا الله وبالوالدين إحسانا وبالوالدين إحسانا وذي القربى واليتامى والمساكين وقولوا للناس حسنا وقولوا للناس حسنا وأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة ثم توليتم إلا قليلا ثم توليتم إلا قليلا منكم وأنتم معرضون صدق الله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic of these nights has been rights within the religion of Islam. We've looked at rights in a theoretical sense, then we looked at them in a practical sense as well. Rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rights of ibadah, and then we started to look at rights of other people. Rights of one's spouse, rights of one's parents, rights of one's children. And inshallah we will continue in that progression. And tonight inshallah we will talk about the rights of one's family. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he put us on this earth, he gave us some responsibility for the earth itself as well. He says, for example, when he is creating Nabi Adam alayhi salam, he says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I am creating for this world a khalifa, a vicegerent, a representative, a custodian of this earth. And that in one way is what our role upon this earth is. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Qasas, verse number 77. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, seek the life of the akhirah. So we work, the primary goal of our, lives, of our life in this world is that we build a house for ourselves in the, in the next life. But at the same time, he says in this verse, but do not neglect your rightful share of this world as well. Do good to others as God has done good to you and do not spread corruption within the land. So Islam, it's a, it's a religion of moderation. And we are told to prioritize the affairs of the Akhirah but not to forget the affairs of the dunya as well. But it can be a bit cliche that we're told, oh, you must look after the world, you have to change the world, you have to improve the world. And in one way, it can be seen as negative. Because number one, you assume that you have the power and the resources to change the world. And number two, there's the hubris that you think you can approach a system and a machinery which is so complex as the world itself, and you can do better than anyone else who has tried. And from that perspective, there is absolutely a negativity. But from the Islamic perspective, 
We don't start by looking at the world, deciding to change it, even though we look to impact the world in a positive way. So how do we impact the world? There are some old notes from a monk around a thousand years ago. And he says that when I was young, I felt that I had to change the world. But as I grew up a little, as I matured, I realized that's too difficult. So I decided I will change my nation. But I found that too was also impossible. So I thought I'll change my town. And I found that too was also too difficult. So I decided I'll change my family. And even that proved too difficult. And he said that only in my old age do I now recognize that I only truly have the power to change myself. But, and here is the important aspect of the story, by changing myself, by improving myself, and shining and reflecting some of God's divine light, I have an impact on my family. And then my family has an impact on the town, the town on the nation, and the nation on the world. And that is the way through the Islamic lens that we look to improve the world around us, first through action, before our words. Jalaluddin Rumi, he writes in some poetry, he says, Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. But today I am wise, so I want to change myself. And we've been taking steps in these concentric circles, as we've talked about the various different rights. And we'll continue that. First we started with the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the center of the circle and upon which the circle is based. Then we moved one step out and we looked at the rights of our nafs and the rights of our body. Then we moved one step further out even more and looked at how we can use that body for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we took one step further out and started looking at the closest relations that we have, our spouses, our parents, our children. And now we'll continue that journey to other members of the family. And it starts predominantly with one's siblings, but also all of the messages from tonight's discussion, they apply to siblings, but also to other members of the family, our grandparents, our, you know, our cousins, our nieces, our nephews, so on and so forth. And Islamically, there is a clear primacy of the family. There is a lot of emphasis which is put on taking care of one's family. For example, the verse that I recited at the beginning, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 83. And remember that we took a covenant from Banu Israel, Worship none but Allah, do good to your parents and your relatives and the orphans and the poor and speak good to all people. There's a clear progression. Allah first starts with himself, then one's parents, then the rest of one's relatives, then the poor and the orphans, and then everybody else. And no one is excluded, not just the mu'mini, but all other people. And then keep up the prayer and the zakah. Similarly, in Surah An-Nisa, verse number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, And fear Allah in relation to who demands your rights and be careful of your duties towards your relatives. There are multiple verses in the Quran which call us to this. The eighth Imam, Imam Ali al-Rada, salawatullahi wa salamahu He says in a famous tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has paired a few things together. You find them together within the Holy Quran. And when one is accepted, the other can be accepted. But if one is rejected, the other might be rejected as well. What are these three pairs that he points to? He says the first is salah and zakat. How many times in the Quran has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including in the verse that I just mentioned, Surah An-Nisa verse 1, Allah, he invokes us to prayer, but alongside prayer, zakat. The other is he said gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gratitude to one's parents. They are linked throughout the Holy Quran. And finally, the link he says is between piety, that is fear of God, genuine true religiosity, and kindness to one's kith and kin, kindness to one's relatives. And we've spoken over the last few nights about the importance of the nuclear family, how it is the foundational, uh, the, the foundation of, of society. The bricks of the society around us are formed by strong nuclear families. 
So what is the first right of the relatives? The first right of our relatives is the right of silatur rahim. That is establishing of the relations. And the term itself, silatur rahim, it quite literally means the joining of the womb. Rahim referring to the womb. And in other words, it means to do good and build relations with our close relatives. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says in a tradition in Bahar al-Anwar, he's speaking to Imam Ali alayhi salam. And he gives Imam Ali quite a beautiful uh, piece of advice. He says, uh, he says, oh Ali, even if you have to travel two years to do good to your parents, do so. Even if you have to travel one year to do silatur rahim, do so. Even if you have to journey one mile to visit a sick person, do so. Even if you have to travel two miles for a person's funeral, do so. Even if you have to travel four, mi four miles to meet a believing mu'min, then do so. All of these different rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put upon us, and amongst them one of the most important is that of silatul rahim, is that of building relations with our families. And when we think about it, by fostering positive relations between our, ourselves and our family members, we gain both practical benefit in this world and spiritual benefit in the akhirah. So what about practical benefit? With your family, you have a stable, persisting unit that has the potential to be on your side for your entire life. There's a, a quite a famous story, you may have heard of it before, that a man who wanted his sons to be united, they were always quarreling, and there's nothing, no argument he could use in order to convince them to join forces, to come together. And so one day he tries to demonstrate to them the importance of unity. So he brings them forward, all of them surround him, and he ties a group of sticks together. And he passes the bundle around to each of his children, and he says, try and break it, try and snap this bundle of sticks. Each of them tries, but none of them are able to break it. He then undoes the knot, and he hands out one stick to each of his children, and he said, now try and they snapped easily. And he said, that is the analogy of the unity of your family. Together you stand, divided you fall. That is part of the importance of one's family. And we gain that benefit from them, so long as we foster that relation. Imam Ali sallallahu wa sallam He said in Nahjul Balagha, However wealthy a man is, he cannot dispense with his clan. He is in need of their defending him with their hands and with their tongues. They are, the, they are one's greatest backers, reuniters, and most affectionate when misfortune falls. Unlike friends, we can't very easily make new family members, especially relatives that we can meet on an equal basis. And this has been understood throughout history. That blood relation is something real that exists in the physical world. You can analyze someone's DNA and you can find right down to the code within every cell of their body. It screams that I belong to the same family as my brother or my sister, or even further out relatives as well. And with that, with that, there's been an understanding that no other relation is as strong especially that of friendship or of promises or of contracts or whatever it might be. That's why if you've noticed, whenever you look at the stories of old, you often find that people, they want to solidify things through marriage. You want to bring two kingdoms together. For example, Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain in the 1400s, what did they do? The two of them they married in order to bring the disparate kingdoms of Spain together. And then it went on to become the most powerful empire the world had ever seen up to that point, or at least the richest. They got all sorts of gold from South America. And throughout the history of Europe, you find constantly there were these relations between various families. In fact, the gene pool in Europe, particularly in the Habsburgs family, got so small because they were, ruled, they were in power for about 700 years that they started to develop actual visible uh, genetic abnormalities. And you can actually see it. There's the famous Habsburgs chin. For those who are interested, you can see it on the portraits in the palaces around Europe.
But that's because they understood, they took it too far, of course, which is why they had those problems. But they understood that when you bring family together, there is a deeper bond. And there's a pragmatic argument here that if we foster the relations well with our brothers and with our sisters and the other members of our family, we can build a unit like no other. And it also, another practical benefit is that it extends our life in this world as well. There are a few traditions that say that once you do Silatul Rahim, it can push the time of your death away. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. He said to one of his companions, O Mesa, the time of your death loomed close to you many times, but through the kindness to your relatives, through your Salatul Rahim, you pushed it away. You extended your life in this world too. So here are a couple of the practical benefits. But there are also spiritual benefits as well. There's a wonderful tradition from our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. And he says that Silatul Rahim, it purifies your good deeds. And he goes on to explain what that means. That when we do Salah, for example, we might not be concentrating 100%. Let's say we were concentrating 80%. So the good deed that we're giving, it's slightly faulty. We're fasting in Ramadan and we get a little bit impatient at some point. We give a faulty fast back. When we're giving charity, we have a mixed intention. So on and so forth. They, they, they are good deeds, and depending on the impurity, they might still be good deeds. And when we do Salatul Rahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, you know those other good deeds, which were on the verge, which weren't quite there, because you have built relations with your family, I accept them as if they're completely pure. Imam Zayl al-Abideen, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, He says in the Rasalatul Hukuq, he records the right of the brother. But of course, this includes the right of one's sisters as well. So think of it as the rights of your sibling. He says, the right of your brother is that you know he is your hand, your might, your strength. Take him not as a weapon with which to disobey God, nor as equipment with which to wrong God's creatures. Do not neglect to help him against his enemy and give him good counsel. If he obeys God good and well, but if he disobeys God, you should honor God more than him, and there is no strength except in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's briefly, let's break down the different points that the Imam is saying here, before going on to the next topic. First, Imam says that they have a right for, to, for us to be their helping hand. But it is both ways. You are their strength and they are your strength as well. If you have a sibling, if you are lucky enough to have been blessed with a sibling, whether older or younger, you might not realize now how important it is. You might not realize the depth of your relation with that person because you're exposed to them every single day. You, have so, you spend so much time with them, you can't wait to get a break from them sometimes. But there's no one else in the world that can have a relation that unique with you because they have grown up with you. They have witnessed the same experiences as you growing up. They've had the same parents, they've had the same childhood, they've had similar economic circumstances, they've had similar hardships, similar highs, similar lows, overlapping interests. And so if we foster that relation, we can foster a relationship with someone the likes of which we will never meet in the real world. And on top of that, it is one established by blood. It's a golden opportunity. And again, they are our strength and we are their strength. And he says that with that strength, recognizing that you have that strength, you complement each other in good, not in evil. So in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in the way of shaytan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he warns us in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number two. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Help one another in virtue, righteousness, and piety, and do not assist one another in sin and transgression. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for he is severe in punishment. On the positive side, 
If we aid our siblings, if we improve things together, we try and do good works, what happens? We're told in one hadith by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, The two believing uh, brothers, they are like two hands washing one another, constantly purifying one another. There is a positive feedback cycle there. If we do good to them, they do good to us, and it can go ad infinitum. We do amr bil ma'roof, nahi an al munkar. And again, we have a unique opportunity to do that in a way that others can't, because we've known them for so long. And again, once we get that relationship right, criticism, genuine, true, sincere criticism is rare. It is so valuable because someone outside the subjective bubble of your existence has seen something that has missed your sight. And if they are sincerely pointing it out, they give you an opportunity to improve without any consequences. And it is the same Amr ibn Ma'ruf and Nahi an al-Munkar and it goes both ways. So assist each other in good and do not, there is that double warning, don't assist each other in bad. Because you, when you have someone as your strength, you can move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or move towards shaitan. There's a beautiful tradition that's recorded in Sahih Muslim. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says that anybody who calls someone to guidance, someone who, in, who encourages them to do good, they will get the full reward of whatever deed that person did without that person missing anything and without you losing out on anything. But if you encourage someone to evil, then you will get the punishment of whatever deed they commit without their punishment being reduced either. So when we convince, so if we're doing haram ourselves, that's one thing. If we know we're doing something wrong, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah give us the strength to overcome it. But at least we have the humility and the shame to keep it within ourselves. But if we share it and we share it with one of our siblings, then we are opening the door of haram for them too. That's another sin. And then if they commit the sin, then we get the punishment of them committing the sin as well. There's no benefit there. There's a virtuous circle if we encourage good and a vicious circle if we encourage the third right that the Imam says is to assist them against their enemies, but not if they are amongst the oppressors. <coughs> and inshallah, we will we'll talk about the rights of enemies on, on Sunday on the Soyim Majlis. But needless to say, that when we support our siblings, we support them in haq. When we support our siblings and our family members, the important underlying rule is that we do so on the path of haq. Islam, again, it is a rational faith. It is a good religion. It does not simply say that because someone is your family, it means they're automatically right. And we link that exactly to the right that we just mentioned, that you encourage them in good and not in evil. And they have that right over you, that if they're doing something wrong, you tell them. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi In Wasa'ul al-Shia, we're told that when he was going on the Mi'raj, he saw the door to hell. And on the door it was inscribed, do not be one of the helpers of the oppressors. In Surah Hud, verse 113, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارُ وَمَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ أَوْلِيَاءَ ثُمَّ لَا تُنْصَرُونَ do not incline yourselves towards those who are unjust, lest, lest the fire touch you, and you have no guardians beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the word that Allah uses here is interesting, because he says, la tarakanu, don't incline towards, not doing injustice, not helping injustice, but even inclining towards it. There are so many ahadith that talk about the dangers of dhulm. And under the, ban the banner of doing Salatul Rahim, we accidentally err into the side of nepotism. And that is where that is the negative part of familial relations. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamahu He says in Wasa'ul al-Shia that on the day of Qiyam, there will be a caller that calls, come forward, all of those who had done oppression, all of the Balimi. 
all of those who assisted the Zalimi and all of those who were like the Zalimi. And that refers to those who incline towards those who have oppressed. So much, Imam says, that even if you gave a pen and ink to an oppressor, and they used that, and you know, obviously the intention is there, you were aware, and they used that as part of their oppression, then on that day, you will be bundled up in the same cage as the oppressor himself, and the assister of the oppressor, and thrown into hellfire. That is another right. We help them against their enemies, but only when it is just. And the fourth right Imam mentions is the right to good counsel. Now advice, when someone seeks advice, it is everybody's right who asks us. The Imam, he says in the Rasalatul Huquq, he has the, uh, the right of the one who asks your counsel, that you give him your counsel and you conduct yourself with him with kindness. Meaning that if someone asks you for help, they have the humility to ask you for help, you try as best as you can to give them that help and you do so compassionately. You don't look down on them, you don't hold it against them, so on and so forth. And that's one of the beauties of wisdom. As Imam Ali السلام, he's differentiating between wealth and, and, and wisdom. He says wealth, when you spread it, it gets smaller. But when you spread wisdom, it gets bigger. And although everybody has a right to our advice and our wisdom, our family has the primary right over it. Where we put the most effort and the most time in order to try and help them. And we are careful. We always think. Because sometimes we think that advice is, is quite light. But in fact, there's, there's a line that I quite appreciated that Tolkien actually he writes. He says that we seldom give unguarded advice, for advice is a dangerous gift, even from the very wise to the wise, because all courses may run ill. So when someone asks for advice, we think about it. We realize that this is a big responsibility. It's not something that we just throw the first thing that comes into our mind. We think about it. And we recognize that even with our, in, our wisdom, with the best intentions, things might go or We want to give them as good advice as we, as we would want to receive. And when we build that positive relation with our family members, particularly with our siblings, it's a two-way street. It's not just the case that you will always give, because from them we also receive. There is consultation, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encouraged in the Holy Quran, such as in Surah Shura, verse number 38. He says that those who hearken to their Lord establish regular prayer and who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation. That we try and engage in this didactic talk with one another. We go forwards and backwards. And our siblings and our family members are in a position where they can, they have the courage, they have the ability to try and, and, and tear what we're saying apart so that we can construct it positively. So that is another right over uh, our uh, advice. And another right is that they have a right over us for kindness and for justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Nahl, verse number 90, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna Allah ya'muru bil'adli wal-ihsani wa ita'i dhil-qurba wa yanha'an al-fahshai wal-munkari wal-baghi that God commands justice and doing good and generosity towards one's relatives and forbids, the, and forbids the shameful, blameworthy and oppressive. And what's interesting is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he says three things. He commands justice and doing good and generosity. But the doing good and generosity, it falls under the category of justice. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to put extra emphasis on that side of justice, on the compassionate side, on the good side. And there are lots of ahadith that encourage us to actively do things, do good things for our family members and fostering these relations. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi He says, the reward of charity is 10 units and the reward of lending is 18 units. Now, Islamically, obviously given the circumstance, Lending someone money without interest, of course, is usually seen as better because you're trying to get them to get back onto their own feet, put them in a productive mindset. So he says, charity, you get 10 units. Lending is 18 units. Of doing a good deed to a mu'min, you get 20 units. But doing a good deed to your family members, you get 24 units. 
So Islam is telling us to convert these theoretical messages into actual practical actions as well. That when we build relations, it's, it's very simple to sit down and say, yes, it's very important that we do Salat al-Rahim. It's important we build these relations. But how? Not just by theorizing, not just by pontificating, but rather by putting it in action, by trying to seek those ways in which we can turn that theory into action. So there are the good deeds that we try and do, and also justice itself. There's a beautiful hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawat Allahi wa salamuhu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad He says, as much as pure and cool water is craved by the thirsty so too do people desire justice and equality and its taste is sweeter and better for them there is nothing better than justice This is an usul al kaf And when we interact with our relatives there will, of course, there will be some relatives that we get on better than others. There will be some who the relationship is more beneficial. But on what parameters? That is where the justice is so important here when we do Salat al-Rahim. Because if we are fostering relations simply because we want something from them, only because of the pragmatic reasons, then we tend to gravitate towards the relatives who are slightly better off, the ones who are in a higher socioeconomic status, the ones who can give us things. And then we tend to neglect those who we see as lesser than us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that psychology. But each and every one of our relatives, they have that right over us, whether they are rich or poor, whether they are in a position where they can give to us or whether they can't. And who knows what the situation might be. Remember, one of the pragmatic benefits of family is that they can always be there for you when the going gets tough. And so, yes, you might see it right now that you're in a position where they take from you. But who knows, maybe tomorrow it will be reversed. And if you help them today, then they'll be there to help you tomorrow. Another right that we're told by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi is not to give any trouble to one's relatives. So even if we are struggling with all of the other positive aspects of building these relationships, at least do not give them trouble. And an ocean of wisdom is contained in these words if only we appreciate it. As human beings, we really want to be the center of attention. We want to give advice. We want our opinion to be validated. We want people to look upon us as learned and as authoritative. And so whenever anyone asks our opinion, or whenever we see an opportunity to give our opinion or comment on something, we immediately jump to do so. But alas, people, they build their relations in a unique way. And they will negotiate their own rights and relationships in a way that works for them. So take the example of a husband and a wife. We spoke a couple of nights ago about the rights of the spouse. And particularly in that relationship, how you can negotiate the rights. How you can form your own unique construct. And if a husband and wife manage to find something that works for them and they are progressing in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fantastic. It doesn't matter whether you think it's a bit strange. It doesn't matter whether you think it's a bit odd. And with one comment, unnecessary, takes you a few moments, gives you a few seconds of importance, you can cause an earthquake in that relationship. We don't always know how much of an impact a simple word can have. As family members, we have a privileged access to our siblings, to our relatives. In what respect? Because we see in their lives in a way that other people don't. Because they let us in and we let them in. And even if they don't, even God forbid, if the relationship has gotten a little bit sour, we still have some insight into them and their thinking and their psychology and their development and their history that other people don't. And with that extra information and access, there comes that added responsibility. You are not on the outside of the fortress. You are a few stages in. So we measure our words carefully. We show that added level of respect. Sometimes, for example, siblings, we enjoy making fun of one another. In, not in a, not in a, necessarily in a derisory way, but just as part of a camaraderie. But what we don't realize is when people get married, they're fostering a new relationship. And if we don't think about things properly and we continue to pull jokes to pull our siblings down, what happens? Their spouse's respect might also go down a little bit. 
and you've opened the door to allow them to pull those kind of jokes as well. So this wisdom of the Holy Prophet is truly profound. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he warns us about this in the Holy Quran as well. And finally, one of the rights before we go on to the next subject is time. Imam Musa Kadhim alayhi salam. He says that try and divide your daily time into four. A time for meditation for God. A time to earn your livelihood. A time to socialize with your friends and a time to spend with the halal pleasures with your family. And it is that last one which is the key that unlocks the door to the rest. And so we have a responsibility not just of giving them kindness, but also of giving them time. And the opposite of Silatul Rahim is Qata'ur Rahim, is the cutting off of relations. And that is one of the greatest sins when done inappropriately, and we'll go on to speak about this in more depth. It is one of the greatest sins in the religion of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Muhammad verses 22 to 3, if you turn away now, and it could be that you go on to spread corruption over the land and break your ties of kinship. These are the ones God has rejected and made them deaf and blind. One of the people that the Imams told us not to befriend is the one who has callously cut his familial relations because in inappropriately cutting these relations, he has cut off the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man went to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and asked him, what is the worst sin? And when it comes to a hadith and you're looking at superlatives, it's always important that we take it in context. The Holy Prophet is speaking to an individual. So for one person, there could be something which is the worst, but the worst might be something else for, for another person. That's why we can see sometimes the Imams, they would give different answers to the same question. All of the answers are correct, but they are more relevant to one person than another. But when this man asks the Holy Prophet, what are the worst sins? He says, number one is shirk. And after shirk, he says, number two is the cutting of familial relations. And the fact that it even makes that list for anybody's answer gives us an idea of the gravity of that decision. And the final of the three that he mentions in that tradition in Al-Kafi is to encourage the evil and forbid the good. And when we do qata rahim there are consequences even in this world as well. Imam al-Baqir sallallahu wa sallamahu He says that Imam Ali alayhi salam wrote that there are three sins that when committed, a person will see at least some consequence of them in this world as well. Not that it will all be contained in the Akhirah. What are those three? He says, number one, adultery. Number two, making a false oath when you swear by God. So swearing by God and lying. And number three, qata'ur rahim, cutting one's relations. And we are told to establish relations even with family members that we don't get along well with. Now it is natural. It is natural that there are people in this world who you get along with a lot better and other people who you get on with worse. There's some, there's some qu quite a profound degree of predictability, actually, when you dissect people's personality models and you look at the different traits that they have, particularly when you look at the big five model. But when it comes to friends, you can choose that you like this person or you don't like. When it comes to family, you don't have a choice. Apart from your spouse, you have no choice. And that is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will test you, for example, through your children. And sometimes, even though we try so hard, things just don't become brighter. But this is not an excuse to cut relations. Shahid Athan, one of the most celebrated Shia scholars of all time, he says that you have five levels of relations, five degrees. When you are building relations, you can do so on five different levels. Number one, when you consider your relative as if they are yourself. That is the best way, the highest way. The second is that whenever they go through hardship, you feel empathy for them and you help them. And then the, th the third level is that whenever, they, uh, whenever you have an opportunity to benefit them, you benefit them. 
The fourth level is that you try and be kind not only to them, but to their dependents. And the final level, the lowest level, he said, is even just saying salam to them. Even just praying for them openly, so they know that you are praying for them. And this is corroborated in the ahadith. Do, however fickle that connection may be, foster it. Don't let it go. Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says, maintaining the ties and charity, it makes the day of judgment easy for you. And it protects you from sins. Therefore, maintain your relations, even through kindness, even through greeting them kindly, even through saying salam with proper akhlaq and being so cordial. And the Holy Prophet, he says, even if you're just offering them a drink of water, something to keep that relationship alive. And it's part of our own honor that we keep that relation. When people know that we aren't getting along with our family members, that puts us down in the eyes of the people. But not only if we don't get along, even if they try to cut the relations, we're told that we should still try and establish them. The Holy Prophet, uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, He says in Sheikh Saduq's Amali, the best of virtues is to forgive someone who has done wrong to you. And it is to maintain ties with one who tries to sever them and to give charity to one who has deprived you. That's one of the recurring themes we've seen with rights. That we fulfill other people's rights even when they don't fulfill our own. And one of the ways we can do that is because we recognize that Allah is just. And Allah will balance the scales on the day of judgment. That even if I feel that I am not getting as much as I am giving, it doesn't matter. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me so much, both in the dunya and the akhirah, that it will more than recompense it. When we be the better person, it might, it might make them a better person as well. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. He had a relative called Abdullah Hassani. And they were... On good terms, they were, things were going okay. But then, on one occasion when the Imam was out, Abdullah, he got into an argument with the Imam. And for one reason or the other, Abdullah, he became increasingly frustrated. And then he began to shout. And then he began to insult the Imam publicly. To try and humiliate the Imam. Obviously, the word try there is important because there's no humiliating an Imam. But the Imam, he stayed quiet. He let him vent. And then he left him. He let him go away. And the very next day, he gave him a little bit of time to cool off, he went over to his house and he recited the verse of the Qur'an from Surah Ra'ad, verse number 21. And those who joined that which Allah bidded them to enjoin and have awe of their Lord and the fear of evil, reckon. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put emphasis on establishing relations. And Abdullah, when he heard this, he said, I must confess, I willfully, I forgot this verse. And now that you have come to me with this akhlaq, now that you have made this step to come to my house and remind me in such a compassionate way, I come down and I apologize profusely for what I have done. And what's interesting about this story is that it seems small, right? I mean, there was, there was an argument. Okay, it was a big argument in public. But that's often where it starts. There's some sort of misunderstanding. And then we forget the importance of Salat al -Rahm. So we take more and more time. And as time grows, as we are not repairing relations, then the distance grows as well. And even if unintentional, it can really rebuild these bridges. There's a wonderful story about two brothers who had a farm. Each of them were farmers and they lived next to one another. But one of these little issues came up and they fell out with each other. 40 years they shared equipment and, and all sorts of aspects of their farm. But they fell out. And they stopped talking to one another, things got increasingly hostile, until one brother, he actually widened the creek between their two farms. And when the older brother, he saw his younger brother had done this, he became really angry. He said, that's it, game over. And he asked a carpenter to come and to build a fence so high that he wouldn't be able to see the face of his brother. So the carpenter, he realized the reality of the situation. And he said, okay, just leave me for the day, I'll see you at sunset. The older brother, he left things as they were. When he arrived, he saw rather than building a fence, the carpenter had built a bridge. 
And the older brother was so angry, he was ready to tell the carpenter off. But at that moment, he saw his brother came running across the bridge with tears in his eyes. And he said, I knew it. I knew you were better than that. However bad I had been in trying to build the distance between us, you still remember the beauty of our relationship. Please forgive me for what I have done. Sometimes it's those small steps that can make all the difference and unlock those benefits of Siratul Rahim. But some of you may be wondering that is this a little bit idealistic? In all cases, all the time, everywhere, we're supposed to build relations even if they're trying to harm me, even if they're trying to kill me? Of course not. Again, Islam, it is a rational faith. And so there are some cases, three in particular that we'll look at tonight, where distance sometimes not only becomes important, but it becomes essential. The first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he introduces us to in Surah Al-Mumtahana, verse number 9. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah only forbids you from respecting those who made war upon you on account of your religion, drove you forth from your homes, and backed others up in your expulsion." Making friendship with them, it is among the unjust. So in this verse, there are a number of egregious crimes that if they are committed, so this is not normal dispute. This is not the normal level of he besmirched my honor. We don't get along, nothing like that. If they are compromising your religion, if they're kicking you out of your home, if they're actively declaring war against you, that is the level where then we may have to distance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave us the example of Abu Lahab, who was the uncle of the Holy Prophet, who Rasulullah kept trying to build relations with until the surah of Surah Al-Lahab, it was revealed. If they are an open enemy and they are actively causing pain, actively causing suffering deliberately, then there might be a case for distance, number one. The second case is, number one is if they have physical harm, number two if there is potential significant spiritual harm. So let's say, for example, that they are open, openly committing some sin, or they have adopted a very haram lifestyle, and they flaunt it. And you know that exposure to that is negative, because Islam, it builds many barriers, right? So alcohol, for example, drinking alcohol is haram. But also touching alcohol makes you najis, you have to wash your hands. Even sitting on a table where alcohol is served is haram. Right? There are several barriers before it gets to drinking, so that even if you slip up upon one, you don't end up in the harm and the clutches of the devil. And so if someone openly insists on this haram and is breaking down those barriers, or they do something so that your children are exposed to some sort of haram lifestyle or the normalization of something totally and utterly antithetical to your values and beliefs, then there becomes an importance for distance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Tahreem, verse number 6, protect your family from a fire whose fuel is people and stones. That's number two. And then the final one is if they are persisting in a haram and you're building relations with them, you're normalizing ties with them and trying to encourage this is promoting that sin. So let's say they've done, for example, great dhulm against one's parents. And they continue and persist in doing it, or they've done something bad in society. But they want to build relations with you because they want some sort of support, or they want to look good in society, whatever it might be. In extreme circumstances, all of these are extreme circumstances. In those cases, then as well, distance, it becomes advised. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in Surah Mujadala, verse number 22, you shall not find people who believe in Allah and the latter day befriending those who act in opposition to Allah and his prophet. Don't befriend them, even though they were their own fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kinsfolk. So we don't encourage that level of haram, but again, only in the extreme circumstances. The main focus is on trying to build relations, except in those detrimental areas. And the final thing to say about Salat al-Rahim, about building familial relations, is not to forget the holy family and the holy household as well. When we build our relation with the family of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, that is a form of Salat al-Rahim. That is a form of building these relations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
He orders the Holy Prophet. Fa'al Amr. Qul. Ma as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al mawaddata fil qurb. I don't ask of you anything except for love of my qurba, love of my near kin. The Holy Prophet, he commanded us to love his Ahlul Bayt. This was an injunction, and an injunction not by him, but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and immortalized in the Holy Quran. And when we build relations with Ahlul Bayt, when we acquaint ourselves in the way that we do that, there's lots of different ways to do it, including, for example, attending majalis like this, remembering them on the days of their birth and their shahada, giving in their name, praying for them, so on and so forth. But one of the ways is learning about them as well. And as we learn and we build that relationship with members of the Ahlul Bayt, we see that there are no better examples of the rights being respected in the history of Islam than through Ahlul Bayt themselves. They are a practical manifestation of the theoretical lessons that Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad gave us.